This year, it was named by The Guardian as one of the top 10 books about revenge in the company of titles such as Wuthering Heights, Crime and Punishment, and The Bible. This true story and its protagonist lived much of his life raising a family in Canada. But during World War II, well, the title explains. It's called Escape, Evasion, and Revenge. The true story of a German-Jewish RAF pilot who bombed Berlin and became a POW. It's written by that pilot's son, Mark H. Stevens, and he joins us now in studio. I'm thrilled to have you here. I'm even more thrilled to have you actually in the studio. It's so great to be able to talk to a real human being in person again. My pleasure, Steve. So welcome. Thanks for Good to have me. you here. What makes, this story is amazing, what makes a 20-year-old in England steal a dead former classmate's identity, enlist in a foreign army, and fight against his own country? That's not really easy to answer because my father never spoke about it. I spent 18 years researching his story long after his death. So I had to piece this, this unbelievable tale together and I'll never really know his true, um, his true reasons, his true motivation. But if I had to guess, I would say it's probably the fact that his, his widowed mother sent he and his two siblings to safety in London during the 1930s, just after Hitler came to power. And he saw firsthand, at least through his family's eyes, what Hitler was doing to the German Jews. He was one of those guys who did not talk about the war? Never spoke about it. And you didn't raise it with him? I was too young when he died. I was just 22. Hmm. So I was busy living my own life. I never got the chance to speak with my father man to man. He had seen the early biddings, uh, beginnings rather, of anti-Semitism ramping up in Germany. How much do you think he was motivated by, as the title suggests, revenge? It's really hard to say, again, because I, I can't be sure of his motivations. I think for, for sure that was a small part of his initial reason for joining up, but he wanted to do the right thing. He knew that Hitler was, was just um, the worst thing that could happen to Europe at that time, especially so close after World War I, which had devastated the continent. But I think more than, more than that, the reason I chose to put the word revenge in the book's title is simply the fact of his survival. That was his revenge. His survival, the fact that he went on to have his own family, and I'm very happy to say, very pleased to say that three years ago in Israel, his first great-grandson was born. I've heard many people in the Jewish community say the best revenge is just surviving. Correct. Because extermination was Hitler's plan, obviously. Exactly. And I didn't, I wasn't raised knowing that I was half Jewish. My mother was French-Canadian Catholic. We were, my father, as far as I was aware, was a British Anglican descent. And so we were raised as Catholics. It was only 17 years after my father's death that I discovered through my uh, crazy 18 years of research to, to put this book together that I realized that I discovered that he was actually born a Jew in Germany. How did you handle that realization? It took me a while to come to terms with it, I have to say. I didn't tell a lot of people at the beginning. And then I realized I don't have anything to hide. I certainly don't have anything to be ashamed of. If anything, I should celebrate the fact. And, I, and now I do. Here's a passage from the book where your father finds himself being ordered to bomb Berlin. Can we have this up, please, Sheldon? Nearing the center of the Third Reich, Stevens felt an unusual sensation. He asked himself whether any of the other crewmen had ever been in peacetime Berlin, such a beautiful and cultured place. Unlikely, he thought. He wondered how it had changed, sure that it now looked very different, courtesy of the RAF, the Royal Air Force. His mind strayed just slightly to the rest of his relatives, still in Germany. For all his aunts, uncles, and cousins, he felt concern, yet he suspected that they were probably dead. Even stronger in his mind than such concern, however, was the anger that demanded revenge. He vowed silently, many Nazis will die tonight. And can we see this picture? There he is up there. If you look over there on the wall there, Mark, here's a, that's him in the pilot seat, eh? That's post-war. That's immediately after the war. But yes, that's him uh, flying what I believe is an Avro Anson small executive transport because he stayed in the Royal Air Force after the war for a couple of years and was the um, executive assistant to an Air Vice Marshal, which is the equivalent of a general in the Air Force, as his private pilot and German translator. Now, admittedly, you're going in the realm of speculation here, because as you pointed out, you, you can't read his mind and you didn't talk to him about this. But he did 22 combat missions during the war 
And at one point, he's got to bomb his own home city, which is Hanover, and there's every reason to believe he's got family down there on the ground that he's being asked to bomb. Including his mother. Including his mother. So how does he deal with all that, do you suppose? I think he put it out of his head. The, the one saving grace for him was that he didn't have to push the button. He was the truck driver. Hmm. He didn't Not the actually... Bombardier. He, he never pushed a button to drop bombs himself. So you think that's probably how he resolved it in his own head? I would have to guess. Yeah. Okay, September 1941 crashes over Amsterdam, survives. Here is the records. We got another shot here, his Hampton bomber, Nazis posing in front of it. Tell us the story here. How'd he get shot down? He was, uh, that was his first trip back to Berlin in the air. Uh, it was September 7th, 1941. Uh, it was nearing the end of his first tour of duty, which was 30 missions. Um, right after they had dropped their bombs over Berlin, they were hit by two flak shells which pierced holes in each one of his wings, which is where the fuel tanks were. Uh, so he knew immediately he would never be able to get back to England because Berlin was a target at the extreme range of his aircraft. They had, in fact, they had to lighten the bomb load to be able to carry enough fuel to get them there and home. So as soon as he saw the fuel tank levels uh, falling and, and had a report from one of his tail gunners that there was fluid leaking out of the wings, he knew right away. So he immediately dove for the ground to avoid fighters that might be hanging around just outside of Berlin, waiting for them to head home. Uh, he ordered his crew to bail out because with leaking fu high octane fuel, the airplane might explode. Um, and he was just going to take his chances and see what happened. Sad, very sadly for him, he, f he discovered after the war, his 19 year old tail gunner did bail out upon, his, upon my father's instructions, but his parachute, it, it, it is assumed, never opened. And so that boy perished. And my father felt forever guilty about that till, till his dying day. How do you know that? Uh, because I was able to finally track down through the internet that boy's niece in England. I flew to London. I met her at the new Bomber Command Memorial, which was dedicated a few years ago. And um, I have to say it was a very emotional moment because my father uh, had wanted to express his condolences and his regrets to, to that boy's family. How do you know he felt guilty about that, though? He took us to the Allied Forces Cemetery when I was 10 years old in 1967, looking for that boy's grave. We couldn't find it because his body was never identified. And my, that was one of two instances in my life where I saw my father cry. Hmm. Your dad was eventually captured. Was a prisoner of war for how long? Three years and eight months, a long time. Now, the Germans didn't know what they had, though, right? Well, fortunately for him, because as still a German citizen, in effect, uh, and a Jewish one at that, he had no protection whatsoever under the Geneva Convention. Had the, the Nazis ever discovered his true identity, they legally would have been able to ex have him executed. So he's, his life was saved in some respects because he had this mysterious identity that nobody knew. He had stolen in London. He'd, he'd, he'd been in London since 1934 and had, uh, through the, the five-year period before the war, had been able to lose his German accent, had been able to learn Eng English. He didn't really know much English when he got there, um, and had passed himself off as an Englishman. He had actually stolen the identity of a dead high school classmate. Let's look at the wall again. You want to bring this up, Sheldon? Is this the, the uh, identity card we have here, the prisoner identity card? There it is. Look at that. Have you got that? I do. Where is it? It's hidden in my safe along with my father's <laughs> RAF logbook. Okay, look at that. <laughs> you got to tell us about that. What are you holding in your hand there? This is what started me on the quest. After my father died, about, he died in 1979, as I said, when I was 22. Um, about eight years later, something like that, I decided I wanted to find out what my father had done to be awarded the Military Cross, which is, is an exceptionally rare uh, medal for valor for... Um, it's exceptionally rare for air crew. It was relatively common for uh, army uh, veterans who fought on the ground because it is, um, it is specifically for bravery on the ground mm. in the face of the enemy. And I discovered through my research that my father had, only one of, had one of only 69 military crosses awarded to the Royal Air Force in World War II. And that made me think, I want to find out specifically what the piece of paper says that recommended him for the Military Cross. It took me 18 years to find it, but I finally did 
in the archives, the National Archives in London, England. And this is what started me going. Um, Where did you, you find this? This was in my father's papers. Um, you'll see that the combat missions are written in red ink. His uh, handwriting? His handwriting, correct. Absolutely. Um, and we get to the, the finally the last page of combat where it's somebody else's writing who details uh, his, his uh, planned mission. Operations Berlin force landed Hold at, yeah, point at to Amsterdam. It. Force landing at Amsterdam. They've got the last flight in there. Right. It just says operations in somebody else's handwriting with the, the, the listing of the crew. And then in my father's handwriting, which must have been after the war when he recovered this document, which would have been put into storage when he failed to return, um, Berlin force landed at Amsterdam. In other words, he ran out of fuel as he was getting close to Amsterdam. One engine quit. The second engine, he, f he thought he had about 10 minutes of fuel left, so he put it down in a farmer's field. What an unbelievable keepsake that is. Incredible. That's not the most harrowing or even crazy story of survival that your father endured during the war. Do you want to tell us about hopping off the train? Sure. <laughs> uh, very, very early, uh, less than a month after he was captured, in fact, he was being moved from, with a whole raft of prisoners, from one prison camp to another on a, a, a very heavily guarded prison train. Uh, they were locked into cattle cars, um, probably hundreds, if not a thousand of them. Um, and as the train slowed down to take a curve, just around dusk, he arranged for a diversion inside the uh, car that he was being held in. Uh, people, people, he got people to hold up their blankets and shake them out as they were putting them down to, to bunk down for the night. And he had unscrewed the, the grill off a ventilator shaft and dove out. And he had prearranged with a Canadian pilot he had met who had been shot down on the same night and captured at the same time as my father, uh, a fellow by the name of Mike Lewis from Toronto, in fact, who I got to know afterwards and who contributed the foreword to my book. Um, they jumped out together. Lewis was the second one out, and unfortunately for him, somebody else had done exactly the same thing in another car at the same moment. In fact, the great Roger Bushel, uh, big X from The Great Escape, if you'll remember, recognize the name, also did the same thing on the same train at the same moment. Sadly, one fellow jumped out, hit the air brake connection between two cars, broke it, the emergency brakes went on immediately automatically, and the German guards started looking out to see what was going on. They saw my father and Mike Lewis running for the woods, and they started uh, taking target practice. W uh, Mike Lewis actually said to me in interviews after, much 50, 60 years later, said to me, the bullets were whizzing by my ears like bees. Oof. But none hit. None hit, fortunately. They were able to hide in a wood nearby. The train later left after a perfunctory search. My father and Lewis um, found themselves relatively close to Dad's hometown of Hanover, and he decided to confide in Lewis, told him his story, and told him they were going to Hanover to visit my father's mother, my grandmother, to get food, money, and civilian clothing to further them onward um, on a journey they were hoping would take them to Switzerland. And, and did he see his mother? Sadly, when he got to his own home in, uh, in Hanover, he learned that his mother had actually committed suicide just before the start of the war, some six weeks before the war, the outbreak of the war. She'd gotten her three children to safety. She was a widow. She had nothing else. The Nazis had taken all of her assets um, and were planning eventually to, to send her to a, a concentration camp. That's, that seems clear. So uh, she took the smart way out. In total, your father made how many escape attempts? Nine. Nine. How many He's, successful? Uh, he got outside the wire on three occasions, including the one I just mentioned about jumping off the train. Uh, he was uh, one of uh, 34 prisoners that are documented to have escaped through a tunnel from a latrine cesspit in a prison camp in Poland. He was captured about 24 hours later, somewhere between Hanover and Cologne on a train by the Gestapo, was tortured and held by the Gestapo for several days, before he was finally reclaimed by the Luftwaffe guards who took him back to their prison camp. And yet, let's bring this next picture up, shall we, Sheldon? Chapter 4. After the war, he settles in Canada, and there is a picture with you and your brother and your dad. Which one are you? I'm on the left, the little you're, guy. You're on the left. You're how old there? Four, probably. Okay. 
And your brother is uh, younger or older? A little older. A little older. When you look at that picture, what goes through your head? Uh, the happiest days of my life. Um, Dad had a, had a lot of psychological problems, not surprisingly, after the war. He was, he was, um, he wouldn't, he couldn't and didn't open up. He was never capable of expressing love on any way, shape, or, or form in any terms that humans normally would expect. Um, I'm not even sure if he lo actually loved my mother. I know she loved him desperately. Uh, she came from a military family as well. Her older brother had been the, com the colonel commanding a regiment in Mont Montreal, uh, an infantry regiment that had uh, gone up through Holland and into Germany at the end of the war, and he, her brother was a hero. So he, he had difficulty with expressing emotions. But as you can see from that photograph, we were very happy. You say you're not sure he loved your mother. Did he love you? And your brother? I think he did, but he never told us that. Well, he'd have been of a generation that just didn't say it, but... That's possible. But they, but he could indi indicate it. He could act it. Did yeah, he, but he, he never seem... played ball with us. He never, he never really hung out with us. He wasn't that kind of a father. He would occasionally take us out for an ice cream cone or to visit a construction site. That was about it. A construction site because? He was in the construction that, industry. That was he his was, business. Yeah, he was an executive in, the, in a trade association. Uh, okay, we've talked about his World War II years. How about the Cold War? Did he have a special job during the Cold War? He did. Uh, not surprisingly, after he uh, stayed in the Royal Air Force for two years after the war and was awarded the Military Cross in 1946 after his exploits came to light, um, and after he came clean and, and was naturalized as a British citizen using the name he had stolen, uh, those exploits came to the attention of a little shadow organization by the, that we know today as MI6. And they asked him... If <laughs> a little like, shadow organization. They asked him if he'd like to work for them. And he said, that sounds interesting. I'll give that a try. And he spent five years with them, in fact. What did he do? He spied against the Soviets in East Germany. He spoke perfect German. He could pass as a German because he was one. Now, if he didn't talk about the World War II years with you, did he talk about those years with you? Not no, that either. Not really, no. In no. fact, I was able to meet, again, through family connections and through my research, um, a fellow who had been one of his colleagues in MI6 in Germany. In, he had actually, um, my father had run into him. My father was driving down Front Street, stopped in front of the Royal York at a red light one day in the probably mid-late 70s, and lo and behold, here was this fellow standing on the sidewalk. My father rolls down the, the window, the passenger side window, and says, Oi, Bobby Mills, what are you doing in Toronto? <laughs> so we, we reconnected that way, sent uh, Christmas cards back and forth. Mills was, living, was retired and living in Germany at the time. He'd married a German lady and was quite happy there. And um, he became a family friend. After my father died, I used to go and visit him. Every time I was in Germany on business, I would make a point of being in Cologne on a weekend so that I could buy him lunch and, and pump him for information about their time together in MI6. Hmm. Great stories. This needs to be a movie. Is this a movie? Not yet, but I'm hoping it will be. I've, I've actually written a screenplay and, and uh, getting close to being able to show it around. Thank you. And who do you, I mean, if you're in the process of writing a screenplay, you have presumably given some thought as to who's going to play your father. What do you think? That's a very difficult question. It's a question I get all the time. But think about it. My father was 22 years old when all of this took place. Who do you know that looks or could act as a 22-year-old? I don't know anyone. Mm. Harry Styles? I don't know. <laughs> you know, Ray yeah. Fiennes could play one of the senior officers or somebody, yes. but, and that would be great, but yeah. I don't know. Last question. Remembrance Day. Mm -hmm. Special day in your life. Absolutely. What do you think of on Remembrance Day? I think of the people who fought with my father, who lost their lives. I think of my family. I think of my grandmother, who didn't fight, but got her children to safety and sacrificed everything to do so. Um, most importantly, I watched the, the, um, the uh, goings-on in Ottawa from the Cenotaph, and I cannot keep a dry eye. Because I know, at least I think I know, I've discovered through all of this research, um, what those people sacrificed. And the, the words, the greatest generation, don't even begin to say it. That's very well said. Thank you. 
Mark H. Stevens, we remind you, the title of the book is Escape, Evasion, and Revenge, the true story of a German-Jewish RAF pilot who bombed Berlin and became a POW. What a story. Mark, thanks for making the trip into our studio today. My pleasure, Steve. Thanks for inviting me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.